I'd like to call the subcommittee to order this morning. Uh, we will be holding a hearing on the cold combustion waste storage and water quality. A month ago, uh, this subcommittee met to evaluate the uh, impacts of coal, ash slide, and Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, the Kingston Power Plant. In that hearing, I noted that this issue was going to be something that this panel would be um, revisiting in the future. Uh, today's hearing is the first step toward fulfilling that commitment. In March, we learned about the implications of federal neglect, the collapse of the Tennessee Valley Authority's Kingston coal ash impoundment was not an act of God, nor was it the result of a random fate. The release of the millions of uh, cubic yards of coal sludge and onto a um, formerly beautiful landscape and the desiccation of a thriving river were the predictable results of regulatory neglect and ineffective federal oversight. In short, federal standards for structural integrity would have gone a good way toward preventing this incident that has impacted the lives of thousands in Tennessee. Our hearing in March forced us to ask the question, how many other Kingstons are there out there? The Kingston spill opened this subcommittee's eyes to the presence of hundreds of similar facilities around the country. It is not just a Kingston problem or a Tennessee Valley Authority issue, it's a national problem. A simple question therefore arises, how safe are these coal ash storage facilities? As we learn more about these storage sites, it becomes clearer that there are some significant public safety, human health, and ecological risk associated with many of them. Even if these storage facilities do not rupture, they can threaten grave human health concerns. Because of the propensity of certain types of these facilities to leach contaminants, Nearby residents face significantly higher risk of developing cancer or suffering from other harmful effects from contaminated groundwater and surface water. These coal ash storage facilities aren't just statistical threats, of course. In recent years, the Environmental Protection Agency has demonstrated uh, damage to groundwater or surface water from a number of these sites. Indeed, a number of these um, damage or potential damage sites are located in the districts of members of this committee. At sites in Alabama, Wisconsin, and Illinois, the EPA has noted instances where groundwater and surface water contamination has taken place, likely as a result of irresponsible coal ash storage practices. These violations of the law and threats uh, to human health must be put to an end. It should be obvious by now that this hearing is about the impacts of coal ash storage on human health and the environment. Any insinuation that this hearing is for anything otherwise would seem to be an effort to distract attention away from the harms that are taking place. We are holding this hearing today to ensure that the true cost of burning coal and its subsequent disposals are passed along downstream. Families should not have to bear the brunt of pollution to cut corners on cost. Cancer should not be the price borne by working men and women for reckless coal ash disposal. That a variety of human health risks have been shown, EPA studies has demonstrated actual damage raises a number of questions about the regulation of coal combustion waste. As such, this hearing is much about EPA's past and future role on this issue as anything else. By the time this hearing is complete, I hope to have answers or commitments on a number of issues. One, how EPA initiated enforcement actions or required corrective actions at all the facilities identified in its 2007 damage assessment in which damage has been proven. 
Does EPA stand by its findings that surface impoundments, especially unlined surface impoundments, cause a grave threat to water quality, aquatic ecosystems, and human health? In addition to investigating structural integrity, will EPA make a commitment to administrative action that result in a minimization of risk to water quality? I, along with the other members of the subcommittee, look forward to what will be illuminating here in this hearing today. Uh, I thank you for being here, and I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Bozeman of Arkansas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I appreciate our witnesses taking the time to be with us today. Today, the subcommittee continues its review of the potential water quality impacts of coal ash storage. This hearing continues what is becoming an all too familiar refrain from the Committee on uh, Transportation and Infrastructure, the declining state of our nation's infrastructure. While public and private utilities have safely operated approximately 600 coal ash sites for decades, with only a few documented failures, the spill at the TVA, Kingston site, once again reminded us of the damages that occur, uh, that can occur when our infrastructure uh, is taken for granted. Homes were rendered uninhabitable, water mains and gas lines were ruptured, and nearby neighborhoods had to be evacuated. Thankfully, no one was hurt, but it's my sincere hope that what occurred at the Kingston coal ash disposal site was an isolated incident. Additional laws or federal regulations would probably not have prevented this terrible accident. New laws and regulations will not replace homes, uh, family treasures, heirlooms, or other personal property lost as a result of the Kingston spill. Even if coal ash was regulated as a hazardous material under Subtitle C of the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, it is unlikely this spill or others would have been prevented. In fact, the Environmental Council of the States recently reiterated its position that the states, not the federal government, should be responsible for the regulation of coal ash as a, as a non-hazardous waste. When Carol Browner was the administrator of the EPA during the Clinton administration, she determined in May 2000 that fossil fuel combustion waste should not be regulated as hazardous waste. In addition, in 2006, the EPA also determined that mercury is retained by the resulting uh, coal combustion residues and is unlikely to be leached at, the le at levels of environmental concern. When managed properly, coal combustion waste can be beneficially reused for construction materials used in our highways, bridges, buildings, and other infrastructure projects. This reuse has resulted in significant economic, social, and environmental benefits. Since 2000, it is estimated that the recycling of coal combustion waste has displaced more than 120 million tons of greenhouse gases. During that same time, more than 400 million tons of coal combustion waste have been recycled in not just construction materials, but in mine reclamation, agricultural applications, soil remediation, and many other everyday uses. Recently, it has come to light that the coal combustion waste was a key component in the construction materials used in the I-35 bridge replacement project in Minnesota. In addition, coal combustion waste was used in the construction of the Ronald Reagan uh, building here in Washington, D.C., which houses many of the EPA offices. Coal combustion waste can be properly managed to reduce its risk and turn much of it into beneficial products. We must be careful that we do not needlessly overregulate coal combustion waste. If we try to regulate it as hazardous substance, recyclers are afraid to handle it and make good use of this material. I appreciate you, Madam uh, Chair, uh, Mrs. Johnson, for holding this important hearing. And again, I, I appreciate the fact that the witness is here and look forward to their testimony. Thank you very much and yield back. Thank you very much. <clears throat> On our first panel, we are pleased to witness, uh, to have witnesses from both EPA and the state of Maryland. Testifying first is EPA's Acting Administrator for Solid Waste and Emergency Response, Mr. Barry Bream. And accompanying Mr. Bream is EPA's Acting Administrator for Water, Michael Shapiro, and the Acting Administrator for Enforcement and Compliance Assurance, uh, Catherine McCabe. 
Mr. Shapiro and Ms. McCabe will be available for questions. Our second witness is Maryland's Secretary for Environment, Sherry Wilson, and we welcome all of you. Your full statements will be placed in the record, and we ask if you will try to limit your uh, oral testimony to five minutes. I will now call on Mr. Breen. Thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the subcommittee. As you said, I am the Acting Assistant Administrator for the EPA's Office of Solid Waste and Emergency Response, and thank you for the opportunity to be with you this morning. Do I need to move it closer to my, my, uh, my mouth? Thank you so much. Um, EPA's efforts involve multiple offices within the agency, as you observed, and with me today are two of my EPA colleagues, Mike Shapiro, the Acting Assistant Administrator for the Office of Water, and Catherine McCabe, the Acting Assistant Administrator for the Office of Enforcement and Compliance Assurance. The testimony today will provide a brief history of EPA's regulatory efforts on coal combustion residuals and an update of our current rulemaking activities. I'll summarize my testimony, but as you indicated, if you would include the full testimony in the record, we'd be grateful. Coal combustion residuals, or CCR, are one of the largest waste streams generated in the United States. Approximately 131 million tons were generated in 2007. In 2007, approximately 36 percent was disposed in landfills. 21 percent was disposed of in surface impoundments. 38 percent was beneficially reused, and 5 percent was used as mine fill. The beneficial use of coal combustion residuals provides environmental benefits in terms of energy savings, greenhouse gas, emission reduction, and resource conservation. In 2007, 56 million of the 131 million tons generated were reused. However, as we know, coal combustion residuals typically contain a broad range of metals, including arsenic, selenium, and cadmium. And due to the mobility of these metals, and the large size of a typical disposal unit, metals, especially arsenic, may leach at levels of potential concern from impoundments and unlined landfills. In May 2000, EPA issued its regulatory determination on waste from the combustion of fossil fuels. At that time, we conveyed EPA's determination that these residuals did not warrant regulation as hazardous waste under Subtitle C of the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. But we also concluded that federal regulation as a non-hazardous waste under Subtitle D of RCRA was warranted. After that 2000 regulatory determination, EPA continued to, to collect new information and conduct additional analyses. In August 2007, we made this information available for public comment through a notice of data availability. The comment period closed in February 2008, and we received nearly 400 comments. We commissioned a peer review of the draft risk assessment, and that peer review was finished in September 2008. The failure of the ash disposal cell at the TVA's Kingston plant in December served as a wake-up call to many about the importance of our coal combustion residual efforts, and it highlighted the issue of impoundment stability. Our previously regulatory efforts had not included this element, but we are now analyzing and considering whether to specifically include impoundment integrity as part of our CCR regulatory development. We are committed to issuing proposed regulations for the management of coal combustion residuals by electric utilities by December 2009. We are currently evaluating a number of different approaches, including revising our May 2000 regulatory determination. As part of our efforts, we are reviewing all the information we have, including all of the comments received from our 2007 Notice of Data Availability and the peer review of the risk assessment. The spill also provided the impetus for our efforts to assess the stability of impoundments and other management units that contain wet-handled coal combustion residuals. We are gathering facility information, performing site visits, or other independent assessments of other state and regulatory agency inspection reports and appropriate follow-up. In March, we sent out information request letters under the Superfund statute 
to 162 facilities and 61 utility headquarters. We have all of the responses but two of the individual facility responses, and we will be following up with those, as well as an additional 43 facilities that we have since identified. We plan to begin our facility field work in May next month. In addition to the ongoing work of our office, the Office of Solid Waste and Emergency Response, the Office of Water has its own efforts underway regarding water discharges from surface impoundments and is currently studying whether national effluent limitation guidelines for power plants need to be updated. EPA is also evaluating disposal practices at coal-fired power plants to determine if these facilities are in compliance with existing federal environmental laws. And we will take enforcement action where appropriate to address serious violations. That concludes my prepared remarks. Thank you for the opportunity to appear, and my colleagues and I will be pleased to answer your questions as we proceed. Thank you very much, Ms. Wilson. Good morning, uh, Chairwoman Johnson uh, and members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Sherry Wilson, and I'm the Secretary of the Maryland Department of the Environment. We are uh, pleased to have the opportunity to share with you an overview of our experience and our regulatory program for coal uh, combustion waste. Uh, by way of background in Maryland, 60% of our energy comes from coal-fired power. Uh, our Maryland plants generate approximately 2 million tons of uh, coal combustion waste uh, product annually. With the implementation of more stringent air quality requirements over the next several years to improve air quality in Maryland, we expect the volume of material of coal combustion waste to double. So our material will double by 2013. We are also uh, active supporters of the notion of the reuse of this material. There are many safe, beneficial reuses. In Maryland, we have essentially three types of storage or dispos disposal. Uh, we have an active mine reclamation program, so this material uh, can be used in the reclamation of coal mines and the reclamation of surface mines. And then our third uh, type of disposal is a straight up land uh, fill type disposal. We do not have the liquid waste lagoons uh, such as uh, Tennessee had an experience that spill. Uh, yet we think our experience um, with this product is important to share. Uh, in 2007, uh, with a new state administration in place, we began to review the requirements in the state for the disposal of this material, both through uh, mine reclamation and uh, straight up disposal. Uh, concurrently with that review, we were faced uh, with two uh, contamination situations. Uh, one surface mine reclamation site uh, where uh, over uh, five million tons of uh, material was disposed of uh, was resulting in groundwater contamination and very unfortunately that resulted in four residential wells uh, that were impacted. Um, as a result of that situation, uh, the state brought the third largest water enforcement uh, case um, in state history, uh, required remediation of the site and, and immediate provision of an alternative water supply and eventual connection to a public water supply for the homes that were impacted. There is a second ongoing enforcement action uh, related also to uh, surface uh, disposal uh, that is resulting in impacts to surface water. So while we don't have the liquid slurry type of lagoons and storage, we have experienced contamination problems uh, from the, the, the type of disposal that we did have. Uh, we made uh, a decision in 2007 that since EPA had not moved forward to set standards, that the state would. And since that time, uh, through an outstanding effort uh, by our technical staff, uh, and uh, with uh, advocates, the support of advocates and the regulated community, we have put in place a series of requirements that I wanted to share with you this morning. Uh, for surface mine reclamation and uh, landfill type disposal situations, we have put in place new permit requirements that are basically uh, equivalent to uh, modern industrial landfill standards, and we have done that through state regulation. 
We have uh, improved the requirements related to the use of coal combustion waste in coal mine reclamation, mostly enhanced groundwater monitoring to make sure that that uh, uh, process is as safe uh, is safe. Uh, we have also put in place a reporting requirement for our generators of coal combustion waste. So we receive now annual reports on the volume of material that's generated and the characteristics of that material, which is very important for the disposal scheme. There are many types of coal combustion waste. Uh, the proper disposal is um, determined in large part by uh, the type of coal that was burned and and so it's important to know exactly the type of material that we are dealing with. Um, and most recently, during the past uh, state legislative session, uh, the General Assembly of Maryland has authorized the Department of the Environment to place a per ton fee on the generation of this material uh, specifically to pay for those regulatory efforts I just mentioned. We do not have a funding source for that. Uh, activity, and this will sort of close the loop uh, and, and uh, allow us to fully move forward implementing this new uh, regulatory scheme. Uh, we have uh, some future steps that we are uh, planning uh, for this year. Uh, we are going to put in place uh, regulatory requirements uh, for the transportation of the material, uh, and also we are going to uh, put in place requirements to define the safe, beneficial reuses of the material. Our, in, our goal is to reuse the material where it can be done safely, uh, but we would like to put in place standards setting forth uh, where that is uh, practical and, and safe. Uh, we have been a strong advocate for the fact that there should be federal standards uh, for, this act, uh, for the uh, disposal of coal combustion waste. We testified before the Subcommittee on Energy and Mineral Resources uh, last summer that there should be some minimum federal threshold. We're very encouraged by EPA's actions to move forward. Uh, and uh, we look forward to working with them and, and uh, providing uh, our experiences and opinions on the, the best way to do that. Uh, for your purposes this morning, though, I wanted to reiterate that it, from our perspective, it's not only the liquid waste uh, that needs to be controlled, but it's also other types of disposal uh, as well as uh, beneficial reuse. And so uh, we really appreciate uh, your taking the time this morning to, to address these issues. We appreciate the opportunity to share Maryland's experience. We have uh, enjoyed, enjoyed great support uh, from Congresswoman Edwards, and we appreciate her interest in the issue, and uh, we'll be happy to try to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just ask you, um, uh, given the experience of groundwater contamination in um, Gambrels, does the state of Maryland believe that the um, coal ash contains hazardous substances? As I said earlier, the uh, there are many there are distinct types of coal ash and the toxicity levels of that, of that ash are determined uh, in part by the type of coal that is burned to generate the power. Um, in the case of the, the Gambrill's contamination, uh, the groundwater contamination, yes, we were concerned that uh, there were uh, constituents of hazardous substances that uh, could possibly leach to uh, monitoring wells. So the answer to that question would be yes. Um, we, we do not, however, believe that it is necessary to regulate coal combustion waste as a hazardous waste. Um, by and large, the data that we have uh, shows that it is, it, is not it is not a hazardous waste. It's not a hazardous waste, but sometimes it contains hazardous substances. Yes. Give me an idea of how you think it should be measured. Well, we uh, believe that uh, the disposal needs to be controlled through essentially requirements that are similar to those that we use for landfills. So in other words, in Maryland, we did not have at the Gambrill site, we did not have a liner 
in place for the disposal of that material. Clearly, we, we know now that that's required, and our new standards do, in fact, require that. Uh, based on our technical staff's uh, assessment of the, the coal combustion waste, and again, the range of different types of coal combustion waste, uh, it is essential to have proper controls in place to ensure that as rain falls, materials are not leaching through and, and reaching groundwater. Um, we know from our experience in regulating both uh, municipal solid waste landfills and industrial landfills that it is, it is possible to put uh, those types of controls in place and to prevent that, that leaching, which is the, the goal here in our view. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Green, uh, at what date did EPA determine that it would develop regulations for coal ash storage and disposal? In, uh, in May 2000, we determined that it was um, appropriate to move forward in developing regulations, and we published that regulatory determination then. Uh, and, of course, we've continued to reevaluate that. And then, of course, after the Kingston spill in December, it brought a new uh, focus to uh, the kind of regulation that would be needed. So there are currently regulations in place? N uh, no, ma'am. Uh, not at the federal level. And not, uh, not under RICR. There are probably dam uh, regulations that the EPA does not administer, but not at the federal level under RICRA. So nothing really has happened in EPA in the last eight years. In May 2000, we made the regulatory determination, but we also indicated it was worth continued evaluation. And several things have happened since then. There was a National Academy of Sciences study that was finished in 2006 um, on the mine filling of coal combustion residuals. In addition, we uh, re uh, uh, re-prepared and revised the risk assessment for the material, and we revisited the damage cases, and we published that material in August 2007 for public comment. We took public comment um, and got about 400 comments, and then we put the draft risk assessment out for peer review, and that was finished in approximately September 2008. So in eight years, hardly anything happened, and now you're beginning to um, look at Do you believe, then, by that delay uh, has resulted in any um, health consequences? That's hard to know. It's also hard to know um, uh, uh, what would have happened, of course. But it, it is a complicated area, both factually and legally. And the steps we have to go through to prepare a rulemaking are those that involve preparing a, a careful record. So it's cumbersome. Uh, yes, ma'am, of course. And so the, because it is cumbersome, you just ignored it? No, ma'am. Tell me what you did do. From May 2000 to now. So the National Academy of Sciences study, and that, of course, took several years. And it involves some of the best scientists available to, to advise um, not just the EPA, but to advise federal agencies and the Congress generally. The draft risk assessment needed to be reprepared, and the, the peer review on that by, by top scientists as well. And then the damage cases, the review of now, we think, 24 proven damage cases, and the assembly of the facts on those, and then the public comment on all of that material. So you're saying that you just had discussion with some of the scientists and nothing else. What, what were the findings? So the National Academy of Sciences um, found that uh, enforceable federal standards should be established for mine filling. And it listed several possibilities, um, both some within EPA's jurisdiction and some within the Office of Surface Mining jurisdiction. But I think it's also fair to say that there are uh, other beneficial reuses as well. And one of the things we've done is explore what beneficial reuses um, uh, can safely be made, such as in um, 
uh, drywall, for example, or in some cement and concrete applications. And, and that work has gone forward as well, in addition to the draft risk assessment that involved a careful study of what the risks are. There are several medals of concern that each of them needs to be uh, thought through. What caused it to be eight years with not much results? Of course, the results are what they are, um, and it, it just takes time. Uh, thank you. Mr. Shapiro, um, do you have any idea why, why EPA has allowed many power plants to discharge toxic metals and pollutants into the nation's water with no permit limits whatsoever? The um, releases from these facilities are subject to the NPDES uh, permitting program, the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, uh, which is uh, run by EPA but uh, administered in most cases by authorized state agencies. Um, those permits. Is your mic on? Yeah. Excuse me? Your mic. Is it on? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. Um, I'll get closer. Um, those limits have to reflect uh, required national uh, effluent limits, uh, as well as any uh, controls that are necessary to uh, meet local uh, water quality standards in the receiving waters. Um, our national uh, effluent guideline limits uh, for this industry segment are quite old. Uh, they only require limits on total suspended solids uh, as well as oil and, and grease. Um, they do not address uh, currently uh, any individual toxic metal components or, or other uh, individual components. Uh, in some cases, states have added requirements uh, to monitor uh, uh, certain toxic components uh, such as selenium and mercury. Uh, but again, in those cases, they may not have established numeric limits. Uh, uh, that would be at the discretion of the permit writer, uh, and it's very difficult to establish such limits uh, given the information uh, currently available. Has it um, occurred to you that you might have some responsibility to initiate uh, some measure to protect the public's health? Um, yes, we're actually in the process of reviewing those existing uh, effluent guidelines uh, and uh, we'll be making a determination later this year as to uh, whether to revise them uh, in order, for example, to uh, address limitations on specific uh, toxic constituents. Now, I know the last guidelines that I'm aware of were in 1982. Has anything been done since then? Um, we, we initiated work, uh, I think two years ago now, uh, to review those guidelines and to begin to gather data uh, from the industry uh, and from our own uh, on-site sampling in order to make sure we can characterize uh, properly the uh, effluent from these facilities and begin to evaluate the need for uh, new regulations and understand the technologies that would be necessary uh, if we should establish new limits. Have you decided it is important to do something about this or? Uh, we haven't reached any final decisions yet. Uh, I think there is significant data that we've ac accumulated that um, uh, make this decision uh, a, a very high priority for us. Who is we? The Environmental Protection Agency. Um, the program is administered by the Office of Water. Do you feel you have any responsibility to initiate some leadership in uh, making sure that something gets attention and perhaps get some procedures in place to correct it? Uh, well, again, uh, the information that we have to date, uh, I think, makes uh, addressing this decision a high priority for us, and we intend to do so uh, as soon as we can uh, complete our work and put together a series of recommendations that would uh, ultimately have to be approved by the administrator. Could you submit to this committee your plans 
and procedures that you're putting together in the next 30 days? I'd be happy to do so. Thank you. Mr. Bozeman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Wilson, in, you noted that in February 2009, EPA requested the states to express their preference concerning three possible options, and uh, I believe that you chose the non-hazardous waste uh, option. Can you tell us the advantages of that approach versus the, the other options that EPA laid yeah. out? Uh, yes. Um, we, we are uh, continuing to examine the issue, and, and so it's a, uh, it's a, a process that's, that's um, iterative. But we are cons the advantages of regulating under Subtitle D, we believe, are that we think that that's a very uh, known process. We already have it in place. There aren't legal authority questions associated with it. And um, we think that um, given the nature of this material, it will be effective. The concern about, uh, there are also advantages and disadvantages of regulating it as a hazardous waste. Um, one of the concerns we have with regulating as a hazardous waste under Subtitle C would be that that's a very stringent regulatory uh, process, and um, we are concerned that it would have the unintended consequence of discouraging beneficial reuse. And with the increase um, in the volume of this material that I think we're, we're all going to face, it, it's very important to um, ensure that we are doing all we can to encourage beneficial reuse. Um, so the, you can see the, the merits of all three of the different approaches. I think that at this point, um, and we may learn more, which could change our opinion, but at this point, um, regulating under Subtitle D um, would seem to us to be, one, protective, and that's the most important aspect, of course, of, uh, of public health. Uh, but it also is um, it's a known process, and, and we are confident that it, that it will work. So if you're in a building and you, you, uh, the concrete there is hazardous waste in it, you know, and you're working in the building and the office wall, like I say, has hazardous waste that really helps the integrity of the concrete and is inert, it's just kind of something that most people might not want. Well, as Mr. Breen said, there are, are many safe beneficial reuses, right. um, concrete b being one. I believe that if EPA were to regulate the material as a hazardous waste, there would be an exemption uh, for beneficial reuse, and there would still be an intent to encourage reuse. Uh, so it's not so much that situation <laughs> as just but there generally. But there would be some stigma. A stick, associated yes. with yeah, that. I agree. So that, that was the point that I was trying yes, to make. I agree. Uh, Mr. Brain, you've heard from Mrs. Wilson that, that her state, uh, you know, feels like that's the route to go and you're questioning and things. Uh, the Environmental Council of States uh, have expressed a similar view. Uh, are any states, have any of the states chosen one of the other two alternatives? I'm not aware of, um, of, of any states choosing another alternative at this time. Um, that at the same time, I haven't done an exhaustive study. There is an important uh, review and survey of that work prepared by the Association of State and Territorial Solid Waste Management Officials, and we'd be happy to provide that to you um, uh, for your use. Good. Thank you. I guess really we're, we're talking about a couple of different things. We're, we're talking about storage problems, and then we're talking about, you know, whether or not it's hazardous waste or not. I mean, those, those are two different issues. Are most of the, the storage problems, and I agree with Ms. Johnson in the sense that, you know, we, we need to fix this uh, where it's safely stored. Uh, we also need to regulate it such so when it eventually winds up in the water system, you know, that, that, it, that it's safe water going back in there, okay? Are most of the problems that we're experiencing, are they, do they have to do with the older facilities versus the new facilities that are coming online? Is the standard higher with the new facilities? We, we do have some information on that. We have a study of facilities that were new between 1994 and 2000, so a 10 to 11 year period. 
And all of the surface impoundments built during that time have liners, which is an important uh, um, safeguard. And nearly all, but not quite all, of the landfills have liners. 97% have liners. Uh, in terms of groundwater monitoring, 81% uh, have of the surface impoundments have groundwater monitoring. So many, but again, not all, have uh, groundwater monitoring. And of the landfills, 98%, so many, many, but not quite all, uh, have groundwater monitoring. Um, so there is a, a good record, but not a perfect record uh, in that regard. And the facility that we had problems with, it, it did not have a liner. Is that correct? Uh, that's my understanding, and we can uh, get you more information on that facility if you'd like. Very good. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. The Chair now recognizes Ms. Edwards. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you um, to all of our um, witnesses today. I have a question for you, Mr. Breen. In layperson's terms, what exactly is the definition of a hazardous waste? Thank you. I'll do my very best. Um, one judge calls this a mind-numbing problem. Um, a hazardous waste is a defined term under the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, and it can be defined as hazardous waste in either of two ways. Either EPA has listed it as a waste, and there are several hundred listed waste streams, or it can be a hazardous waste if it exhibits any one of four toxicity characteristics, corrosivity, um, let's see, TCLP, toxicity, corrosivity, uh, ignitability, and um, I see, I, I'm going <laughs> to okay. um, reactivity. Thank you. <laughs> ICRT. All right. Now, so then let me ask you, what is it about um, coal ash, the waste, that makes it not a hazardous waste? Thank you. So EPA has not listed it as hazardous. Okay. So I got that part. On the first one. <laughs> and in fact, uh, under a statute often called the Bevel Amendment, uh, named after Congressman Bevel, um, there are special steps we would have to go uh, go through in that regard. Um, but in addition, coal ash as a whole and coal combustion re residuals rarely test positive for those four characteristics. A few percentage of the time they do, but overwhelmingly they don't test positive for the four characteristics. At the same time, they contain within the metals, um, for example, arsenic and and mercury, and those metals are identified as hazardous substances under CERCLA. So there is, under, under the Superfund statutes, there are hazardous substances in coal combustion residuals, even though as a whole they have not been listed as hazardous waste and tend not to test out under those four characteristics. So let me ask you this. Um, according to the EPA's 1999 report to Congress on waste from combustion of fossil fuels, Quote, low-income communities and people of color sh shoulder a disproportionate share of the health risks from these wastes. The poverty rate of people living within one mile of power plant waste facilities is twice as high as the national average, and the percentage of non-white populations within one mile is 30 percent higher than the national average. And it goes on to say, similar high poverty rates are found in 118 of the 120 coal-producing counties where power plant waste increasingly are being disposed of in unlined, unregulated mines, often directly into groundwater. So for those 118 low-income communities and uh, communities of color, what's the hazard to them? Thank you. So there are probably several hazards. Um, one is a groundwater release in an unlined uh, facility, especially a release in groundwater and metals. And a uh, substantial number of them are unlined. Uh, yes, especially those built longer ago than those built recently. Um, so groundwater contamination is certainly of concern. Surface water contamination is of, uh, of concern. And then, of course, the stability of the impoundments themselves, the kind of catastrophic um, single disaster event, like in the Kingston facility, would be of concern, too. Not so much a long-term exposure, but just the sheer volume of uh, over a billion gallons of water 
in, and, the, in the Kingston example. And then um, have you updated the 1999 report? Not to my knowledge, but we can check. So you don't have recent data on the phenomenon of the impact on low-income communities and people of color of 118 of the 120 coal-producing counties? I, I haven't seen an update. Thank you. And um, lastly, um, Secretary Wilson, and thank you for being here. Uh, I think we're doing tremendous things in Maryland. Would, would Maryland have a problem complying with um, EPA regulation should EPA decide to regulate coal ash as a hazardous waste? Uh, no, if that's a determination, Maryland will uh, abide by the federal requirements. Uh, uh, so we would not have a, a problem complying. Um, it's, it's really more a matter of a policy question and what, what the most effective approach, approach is. And have you had an opportunity to analyze any of the data that you've collected from the groundwater mo monitoring and, um, and looking at particularly the impact of the, your neighboring states that have unlined um, facilities that have seeped over into Maryland's waterways? I am not aware of any impact from out-of-state facilities to Maryland, uh, but we are certainly aware of an impact from our, our in-state facilities to our, to our groundwater and uh, are very concerned about those public health impacts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Hall, who knows firsthand what neglect will do for cleanup. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ranking Member Bozeman, and thank you to our witnesses. Um, Administrator Breen, I wanted to ask you uh, if you could elaborate more on your guidelines for mine filling, please. At, at the present time, um, I don't know that we have um, guidelines at the federal level on mine filling, and I'll turn to Secretary Wilson to see if she can elaborate. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, we have uh, requirements for two types of mines, uh, deep coal mines and then surface, mined, uh, surface mines. Uh, with regard to the latter, surface mines, our new set of requirements are, are basically akin to uh, state industrial landfill type regulations. Uh, with regard to the, the deeper coal mines, uh, the requirements are primarily twofold. One is to make sure that the volume of coal combustion waste product and the type of that product is appropriate so that you get the right balance to com combat acid mine drainage uh, uh, and to make sure that the um, characteristics of the leachate are, are stable and they are positive and not a negative impact. And then the second important part of that set of requirements is groundwater monitoring. You said in your testimony you were concerned not only about liquid waste, uh, but also other byproducts. What would those be? Well, um, I may not have been very clear, but in Maryland we don't have these um, impoundments that, uh, that contain liquid waste. Um, we, we are mostly dealing with mine reclamation and, and, and just disposal. Uh, and, and so um, while rightfully so, there's been a tremendous amount of discussion about liquid waste and, and li slurry lagoons. We don't face that situation, yet we, we are concerned about ensuring that public health is protected in, in the mine reclamation area and then in the, in the regular disposal of non-slurried coal combustion waste. Thank you. And uh, Administrator Breen, uh, would you be agreeable to, or do you think the agency would be agreeable to laboring, labeling or notification uh, for concrete or lightweight aggregate or other materials that are made with CCW as a component? Thank you. And Congressman, uh, may I first ask my colleague to answer part of your question that you asked a moment ago about mine filling and the drinking water program does have a role in that. Um, thank you. Yeah, just to uh, add to Barry's uh, comment, um, under the Underground Injection Control Program, which is a program administered by EPA and uh, authorized states under the Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, certain types of mine backfilling operations would be considered uh, injection wells and would be regulated under uh, one of the categories of uh, our Underground Injection Control Program. And there, were, there are 
uh, minimum national requirements, uh, which uh, some states build upon uh, in uh, regulating these kinds of facilities. Uh, again, it, not necessarily every backfill operation, but those that uh, constitute wells, uh, of which in 1999 uh, we documented there are about 5,000 uh, such backfill wells uh, in, in the country uh, are subject to um, uh, our underground injection control program. Okay, and regarding labeling or notification of products uh, uh, that are beneficial uses, quote unquote, that have uh, CCW as a component like concrete or, or uh, cinder blocks, what have you, uh, any talk of that? And your question, Congressman, is whether we'd be open to considering um, providing some, some guidelines for labeling in that regard, and, and we'd be happy to. Um, and uh, regarding the metals of concern that you spoke about, cadmium, ar arsenic, mercury, et cetera, which are generally considered to be poisons, uh, especially when they exceed the uh, standards by 30 times or so, uh, are they the same in coal as they are in clean coal? Uh, I'm going to have to get you that, record, that answer for the record. I'm not uh, familiar. Well, I've just been watching TV a lot, and I, I guess I've heard that term enough times that I wanted to ask that question on the record. Uh, thank Is you. Is clean I, coal any different than regular coal in terms of the content of or emissions of or residue of arsenic, mercury, cadmium, and other poisonous metals? Uh, I'll get you the answer for the record. I'm not personally. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. T. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member. Uh, I'd like to also thank all of the members of the panel that are here. Uh, Secretary Wilson, uh, could you describe to me uh, possibly Maryland's position uh, towards the regulation of, re of the reuse of the coal combustion waste material? Uh, it, I, I will not be able to do that in too much detail because we're just uh, beginning our efforts uh, to uh, better define that. But I can uh, tell you uh, what our concerns are. Um, we want to make sure that we're doing all we can to encourage safe reuse, um, uh, fiberboard, cement, um, seem to be um, very safe, and 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 so we want to look at those. But but we're generally not as concerned as with those reuses as with some others, such as using material in highway embankments. Um, there are, there are a range of uh, of uh, suggested uses, and we don't have standards in place currently that are aimed at both encouraging the reuse but making sure that it's safe. So we're really just about to embark on that effort. So that's about all I can, I can tell you. It also, is there going to be some consideration of maybe using a, a certain amount, quantities of it a, as a soil additive or in agriculture as, as a fertilizer or anything along those lines? Uh, there, th we do have a, a process in place to review from a regulatory perspective that kind of use. Right now we don't have um, a, a, a demand, a tremendous demand in Maryland for that, uh, but we, we would look at that. I, I should also add that um, it, it's, ve it's a very large task for a state like Maryland to in embark on this kind of um, effort. And, and so um, to the extent we can get assistance fr from the Environmental Protection Agency and the federal government, it, it is much welcomed. But, but you do think that there, there should be safeguards put in place to regulate the reuse of that material? Yes, sir. Uh, m Mr. Breen, uh, on the Kingston spill, was, was that spill a, uh, fr from a lack of regulation or monitoring, or are you familiar with that? Well, that's hard to, I am familiar with the, with the spill. It's hard to answer. It was regulated by the state of Tennessee and, um, and, and periodically inspected by regulators. But at the same time, um, there is a question whether it would have made a difference had there been uh, federal regulations. And um, it's always hard to know what would have happened because you just don't have that kind of, kind of certainty. But uh, that is one of the things we are considering and moving forward in the rulemaking is to what extent we, can we prevent uh, this kind of, of catastrophe from happening again. And that's the kind of thing we'd like to do. 
Yeah, you know, one of the things I was concerned about is that, you, you know, we're not setting up a new tier of regulations here because somebody wasn't monitoring or regulating, somebody wasn't doing the job that they were supposed to be doing. And, and rather than make some hard decisions at, at that spot, are we setting up a whole other tier of regulations to get around that? Uh, Congressman, your, uh, your question would be, are we making sure that we're not duplicating work that's already um, underway? Or be sure that we're just not letting somebody not do their job, and instead of telling them to start doing their job, that we're making up a, a, another layer of uh, regulations. I see. Thank you. Of course, in almost anything we do in this area, it would be a partnership between states and the EPA, and it would be important to have a close working relationship in which we don't duplicate each other's work and rely on each other. Okay, so as you set the regulations, the state and local agencies will be involved in setting those regulations? Yes, uh, very much so. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Titus. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I would address this to the members of the EPA. You've made it really clear that you're not regulating these coal uh, combustion waste storage facilities and that you've also mentioned several times that this is what the states are doing. You just said, now said you'll have a close working relationship with the states in the future just as you have now. Well, there's considerable evidence that uh, there's wide variation between the states or among all the states when it comes to this regulation, and even within states among the different facilities, some are lined, some aren't. Now, this fragmentation seems to me not only to hurt the people who live in the states that have lax regulation, but it can hurt people in ne next door states who may have strict regulation because we know water doesn't recognize state boundary lines. In fact, that's happening in Nevada with the proposed uh, coal-fired plant in White Pine County. People across the state line are getting involved in that debate. I would ask you, what are, what's Nevada's policy for regulation? How many of these facilities do we have in the state, and which ones are lined and which ones aren't? Thank you. I, I don't have with me information specific to Nevada. Mm -hmm. um, it is the case, though, that we are uh, committed that by December of 2009, we will propose uh, a federal regulatory uh, package on this. And so um, the, the, the fact that there are no federal standards under the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act at this time um, is not a permanent uh, situation. Well, I hope so, but I keep hearing that you said this nine years ago, eight years ago, ten years ago, six years ago. Now it's December. I hope it won't I hope it really will be December. But what worries me is that you say you don't have that information about Nevada. I get the feeling that not only have you not been regulating it, but you don't have much oversight on what's happening in the different states. And so there's not much incentive for the states to get busy and do something on their own to make up for the fact that you haven't been doing it at the federal level. And I would just carry that one step further and ask if you know what the states are doing about regulating beneficial use. Do you have any sense of what the states are doing across the country in that area? And do you have any plans to start to regulate beneficial use at the federal level? We, we have a study on state um, programs in this area that I'd be happy to provide you. I, I just don't have all the state-by-state state information in my head, uh -huh. but, um, but I'd be happy to provide you the copy of the study that, that, that we have. Um, in terms of regulating beneficial use, uh -huh. it, it is an important part of this issue, which is that we'd want good, safe practices to continue. And so, for example, in some concrete and cement applications, mm -hmm. coal combustion residuals are actually superior mm -hmm. to some of the virgin products that would otherwise have to be uh, mm -hmm. mined out of the environment. And this is an important part of what we're doing. So you do have plans then to put in place some regulation or some... What, what we'd want to do is recognize the beneficial uses in the plan that we do put in place so that we we don't um, do more harm than good in that regard. Well, I heard this, this Secretary, Ms. Wilson, was talking about that Maryland was moving in that direction to come up with some plans or guidelines or something. Were you going to do that at the national level? Are you going to leave that to the states? I, I can't say yet what the regulatory package will look like at the end of the year. We still have a lot of work to do between now and December. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Napolitano. Mr. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for convening this very important issue on uh, um, the uh, uh, hazardous, as it regards hazardous waste. Uh, as, as the co-chair of the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, co-chair, as the chair of the uh, Water and Power Subcommittee under Natural Resources, this is of great interest to me. Uh, and the fact that uh, EPA has a lot of information or does not have an information on some of these issues is, is troubling. Um, and I'd like to ask Mr. Breen if um, th there's enough information of, uh, that you have on the uh, storage problem. Uh, how, how many are there actively being used in, in, in throughout the country? And to that, you say that most of them are lined. Uh, are the new ones uh, being required to be lined? Some that are lined with clay. Are they being checked for cracks to ensure that there are no uh, seepage into the aquifers? Um, how do you know this? Do you have sufficient uh, staff funding to be able to carry out that which will protect environment? And, and dovetailing with Ms. Edwards' questions about siting in uh, low-income and poverty areas, that's quite an issue for a lot of us that uh, concerns us. And do you look at that as part of the siting uh, uh, um, uh, 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 permitting. I know it's a lot of questions, but they're all, all based into one. Thank you so much. Um, uh, one of your questions was, uh, how do we know and what do we know about the, the, the size of this group of facilities? Last month, on March 9th, we sent out uh, information requests uh, using the authority of the Superfund statute, and information requests is actually a term of art. These were enforceable uh, 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 demands for information, and a failure to answer would be uh, an enforceable offense. Um, we sent those to 61 corporations uh, representing 162 facilities, where we added up just over 300 uh, individual units. So a corporation could have more than one facility, and a facility would have, could conceivably have more than one unit. Uh, and uh, since then, one of, the, one of the questions we asked of the corporations was, are there any other facilities that are not uh, currently on our list? Because we used a, a survey uh, from the Energy Information Administration from 2005 uh, to develop our, our information requests. I'm assuming they, they don't have to come to you for permitting. I'm sorry? They do not have to come to you for permitting the, to establish. That's it. correct. There's no federal requirement with the EPA for a Should permit there be? at this time. I'm sorry? Should there be? Well, that's an important question that we have to resolve in the rulemaking. Under Subtitle C, uh, there would typically be a requirement for a federally uh, authorized permit. And under Subtitle D, there would not necessarily be that, uh, that requirement. Just to finish up, though, on your question, uh, uh, when we asked the corporations, are there any facilities that are not on our current list, uh, we identified 43 additional facilities. And so earlier this week, I sent a letter to the managers at each of those 43 facilities to answer the same questions that their colleagues had answered last month. So we now are aware of about 400 units at some uh, uh, just over 200 different facilities. And they've all been sent the same letter now that ask questions about the stability of their uh, of their dams, of their impoundments, with a goal toward being sure that another Kingston-like uh, spill is prevented. We'll send teams out starting uh, in May uh, to visit facilities that uh, have not recently been visited, and we'll make sure that we, by the end of this year, um, have looked at every one of the units. Can you tell me how many uh, uh, personnel you have to be able to do this job, and you're starting next year or this year in May? Right. I do not have a specific number of people working on this project, although I can tell you that when I sit in meetings, uh, we have a lot, and it's a, a very lot high being, priority for us. A lot being roughly how many? Oh. Because if, if we're going to have you inspect, well, you say the ones that have not been inspected are the ones that are uh, due for inspection, <clears throat> and there's 400 of them, and that's the ones that are reported. Um, it, when will we have a good idea as to their status and whether or not they are in violation of EPA rules? In fact, I can help with what we know so far about that, <laughs> and I, I should share with you that most of the assessments uh, on, on a facility basis where people go out and visit a facility, 
will be done by engineers that we've hired through a contract rather than civil okay, service. Contract. Okay. So uh, it turns out, at least within the EPA, we don't have uh, the, the, the number of people with this kind of talent. But at the same time, we, can, we have gotten them through, uh, through a contractor. Um, what we can say so far is that from the approximately 160 facilities that have answered our letter that we sent last month, uh, we've identified 44 that are, in, are mm -hmm. in locations that could present a hazard if there were a, a breach. These are called high hazard. Not okay. to suggest that the dams themselves are in danger of breaking, but that their location okay. presents a hazard. That is, they're kind of uphill. My time has expired, but I'd like to ask that we, you render to this committee uh, some of that information that you're garnered, yes. state by state, the numbers of the line, the unlined, and what uh, uh, time frame you feel is going to be necessary to be able to uh, review those. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, before I call on Mr. Kagan, let me just ask you, you talked about the structure, but not water quality or water content there. Uh, it, in, in terms of that survey, are you concerned about the contents of the water or just structure? Madam Chairman, there were a number of questions, and what I should do, I think, is give you, um, uh, after, the, after the hearing, the, the, the list of questions so you can see for yourself what we asked of each of the facilities. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bozeman. Thank you. Ms. Wilson, you testified that, that uh, if, you know, if you were forced to or, or if the, it came down that this would be regulated as hazardous waste, can you give us an idea of what that would do to utility rates? You know, we have concern about various individuals. What that, what's that going to do to the single moms and the, uh, the working poor, you know, that are trying to pay their, their electricity bill every month? I, I really can't tell you what impact that would have on, on utility rates. Uh, would it other have than, an impact? I don't know, other than to re reiterate that. What's if, your gut feeling? I, I, I really could not tell you. Uh, I, but I would like to, to say that I would hope that if the material were regulated as a hazardous waste, there would be a clear, defined process that would exempt beneficial reuse so that we could really encourage the, the reuse of the material. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. We have a vote on, but Mr. Kagan, you might be able to get your questions in. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you for appearing here today. I gather that you're the new kids on the block that you're just getting in the saddle, uh, so I won't give you 100 days grade yet because this is not CNN. This is the uh, United States Congress, we're trying to figure out what is the best thing to do, not just for our waterways, but also for our human health. And when Ranking Member Bozeman brings up the question about the cost uh, to the consumer for the excessive uh, use of coal, the utility costs may go up, but we have to put into balance there the human cost. That uh, I don't know what the safe level is of mercury, but it's got to be almost zero. And so there are other costs that come along. The EPA did do a study with regard to the uh, metals and other toxic materials leaching out of the uh, coal waste. And I noticed that the report mentioned boron and cadmium, selenium, barium, beryllium, boron, uh, arsenic, but it didn't mention mercury. And if you don't have that answer uh, today, I'd like you to provide uh, answers to this subcommittee with regard to the amount of mercury that the coal waste has uh, contributed to our waterways. In northeast Wisconsin, our fish have a high concentration of mercury, and we believe that about 40 percent of that mercury that's in the fish in the Great Lakes and in northern Wisconsin, Minnesota, may have come from dirty coal across the globe in, in China. So uh, this is not your area of purview, but I'd appreciate if you could uh, chase around the EPA and and find those numbers. If those numbers don't exist, I'd like you to propose a study uh, to take a look at that. Um, I'd like to ask uh, the three of you from the EPA, if you couldn't please provide us with the uh, three most important things you think you're uh, intending to do uh, in the next six months. And then uh, in a follow-up uh, letter, uh, 
three months from now. Please provide this subcommittee with the answers to how you're progressing. Let's start with Mr. Shapiro. Sorry. Um, when you say, uh, with, res with respect to this specific problem, the three most significant things, or? That's right. Okay. Uh, well, I, I can give you uh, two right off the bat. Uh, one I, I mentioned earlier, we're uh, thoroughly reexamining our effluent guideline, uh, and we'll make a determination as to whether we need to uh, develop new guidelines that reflect some of the issues that, were di that you, dis you discussed with respect to uh, heavy metals such as mercury uh, and, and other uh, materials uh, in the effluent. Uh, so that's number one. Uh, number two isn't specific to this kind of uh, facility uh, generally, but has important significance, and that is we're reexamining our uh, water quality criterion for selenium, uh, which is one of uh, the contaminants of concern from these kinds of facilities. Uh, we had proposed a revised standard in 2004, got a lot of comments on that, and we uh, went back to the drawing board, so to speak, uh, and we expect to propose uh, a revised standard later this year. Um, number three, we're developing a guidance for uh, permit writers uh, to assist them in uh, making sure that with the existing authorities we have uh, in the NPDES program, uh, they're asking the right questions and looking at the right issues at these facilities. And again, that's something that uh, we will complete uh, within the next six months. Thank you. And uh, if I might offer four instead of three to answer your question. In the interest of time, do so in writing, but okay. give me your number one. Oh, the one number one? Yes. Uh, well, it's always hard to pick a favorite child. Um, I would uh, I would just list for you the the intent to do the uh, uh, the rulemaking by December of 2009. Um, Very good. Certainly one of them. Ms. McCabe. Of course, from the enforcement office's perspective, it is our responsibility to uh, review the compliance of the coal-fired power plants with surface impoundments with existing laws. As we've heard testimony, of course, we don't have much existing law under RICRA. Uh, we also have Clean Water Act, uh, some discharges from um, end of pipes, uh, permit permits and regulations that apply to the facilities. And we are in the process of investigating the situations based on all the information that the agency has collected that we think might present um, significant threats to public health or the environment for which federal enforcement action could be appropriate. Thank you. I look forward to your report in three months uh, to the subcommittee. And I'll just close with a comment uh, and a question as to whether or not there is such a thing as, quote, unquote, clean coal. It's dirty when you mine it. It's dirty when it is hauled to the place of combustion. And it produces uh, not exactly the cleanest of air and effluent materials. So we, really ha we have to ask the question, is there anything really clean about coal, especially when you think of the energy that we're getting out of it, where 50 percent of the energy that's in the coal is uh, taken up along its transportation route uh, to the facility where it's going to generate the electricity that we so uh, desperately need. So I yield back my time, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much, uh, Chair of our full committee, Mr. Overstar. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and thank you uh, and, and Mr. Bozeman for conduct conducting this hearing and for EPA for being here to respond. Uh, for me, the, the issue is, is not whether uh, the uh, material is toxic or hazardous, uh, but that is behind uh, retaining structure, a levee or a dam. Uh, and the issue of hazard, uh, I think, can be very simply answered. A 60-foot high wall of water is hazardous to anything in its path. Whether it's toxic or not is, is of secondary significance. So the structural integrity of the retaining facilities is a real issue here. Uh, we had, uh, in, along the north shore of my district, north, meaning the north shore of Lake Superior, uh, an iron ore mining processing plant that uh, has a power facility and stores fly ash. That uh, fly ash facility, retaining facility, failed. And a wall of fly ash, uh, 20 feet high, rolled down the hillside, 
spilled over U.S. Highway 61, and some of, some of it spilled into Lake Superior. Uh, traffic was stopped uh, for a couple of days, and there's no other route. The only way is to get in a canoe and paddle along Lake Superior. Uh, I'm familiar with fly ash, and I was in, uh, uh, in college, worked at a ready-mix concrete facility, make, which made, as part of its work, concrete blocks with fly ash. They were one of the early ones to, to experiment with fly ash. I appreciated the fly ash blocks because they weighed half the, the amount of a full concrete block, 21 pounds rather than 42 pounds, 48 pounds for a corner block. I still remember. Was this facility lined or unlined? The facility is the Kingston facility? Yes. Um, I don't have that answer readily in front of me, and unless one of my colleagues does, we'll get it for you for the record. Was this a pancake-type structure, that is, layer added upon layer upon layer without broadening the base? Let me get you that for the, for the record. That, that's my understanding. That's what it was. Uh, the average uh, height of these retaining structures in the range of 15 to 20 feet, this one is 60 feet. Who conducted, who's responsible, who's the primary responsibility for uh, evaluating the structure, in the integrity of the structure itself? One of the things we want to do is to follow up, so we've written the letters, and uh, to every uh, electric utility, coal-fired facility in the country, and we're gathering that information right now. We have answers to all but two of those that we sent last month, and we sent another group out earlier this week. Of course, the company itself, in this case TBA, has a primary responsibility. Is there a state dam inspection facility? The answer depends on the state, but in, T in Tennessee's case, there is an active and, um, and excellent uh, group of inspectors. And uh, in, in EPA's responsibility, uh, does EPA conduct on its own or contract out to inspection services to, to do facility uh, uh, inspection of facilities that contain hazardous material? With, with respect to the dam integrity, uh, EPA does not have regulations to enforce in I that understand area. that. And we don't have the talent in the numbers that we would need it. And Could you contract out to the Corps of Engineers, engage them to do that work on EPA's behalf? We have contracted out to a private contractor after consulting with uh, several other federal agencies, including the Army Corps of Engineers, and, and we went to a private contractor who could mobilize very quickly. Hmm. And the Corps did not, could not, or was not interested, or their price was too high, or what? I don't think it was a matter of price, and I'd have to leave to them, um, but we, this, would, this would require, we wanted to be able to see, to, to see every facility that needed to be seen in person okay. uh, by the end of this year. Well, this committee many years ago, and then more recently, uh, uh, enacted uh, dam safety legislation uh, requiring inspection of dams of, of all size, configuration, height, uh, and use. And then we, uh, uh, during the previous uh, majority, uh, uh, reauthorized that uh, legislation. And the Corps of Engineers has the principal responsibility of, of, of doing that work. Uh, I, th I think it would be beneficial to get the Corps back into this picture, however good your private contractor may well be. Uh, but uh, I, I think it's good to have their experience in this matter. And Mr. Chairman, in that regard, when we get the results from the private contractor, we intend to share them with other federal agencies Good. for advice and counsel about what to make of those reports. Well, the, 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 uh, there's, there's not only the, the risk of failure, but there's a risk of seepage. We have, we have those problems all along the Mississippi River from uh, just south of uh, St. Paul all the way to New Orleans, uh, levees that are in place that are old, that have uh, been uh, weakened by burrowing owls, by rodents, by uh, vegetation, and, and they're, they're leaking, and, and, and they're not, they were not built deep enough. Uh, they were built to withstand the 1%, that is 100 year, once in 100 year flood uh, uh, occasion, and now we're, we're having uh, events of far greater 
uh, uh, ferocity, and the Corps has to go back and, and reevaluate all these structures. Similarly, with these fly ash retention facilities. We'll look forward to your report. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We, we'll complete with the first panel, and thank you for coming. Look forward to hearing from you. We have a vote on, so the second panel will be uh, up as soon as we can get back. Thank you.